Hello, welcome to the Monday, June 27th, 2022 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I'm recording from Stockheim, Germany. We had a couple of interesting diaries over the weekend. Uh, let me start with Xavier's uh, that analyzes an interesting Python script that actually uses Python GUI libraries in order to interact with the user. I personally suspect that this may be done to make reverse analysis more difficult by adding that user interaction. The script will display a brief notice to ask the user to click that notice. Now, once the user clicks, a web browser is being opened and the predetermined web page is loaded. Likely malicious uh, in this particular sample, uh, that page was not available. Could be a phishing page, could be some additional uh, malware. The idea here may be that uh, by adding that user interaction, any automated script analyzing this particular malware, like running in a sandbox or such, may not be able to interact with it. So the malware doesn't run and the analysis fails. And we got sort of a second interesting diary with uh, PowerShell scripts again, where the malicious PowerShell script is actually passed to PowerShell via the clipboard. Uh, uses the clip.exe binary that comes uh, with uh, Windows in order to copy standard out uh, to uh, the clipboard. And then this clipboard essentially being executed using PowerShell. Reasoning behind this trick is likely to avoid writing anything to a file. So uh, that way you're able uh, to again evade some analysis. Now, a lot of uh, anti malware tools are looking at memory, but think about it from an incident response uh, point of view. You will not be able uh, to recover uh, that data that was uh, briefly written uh, to memory if you discover this compromised uh, system. And then some other interesting tricks here to interact with web applications, particularly in order to bypass some set two factor or multi factor authentication scheme. A security researcher, Mr. Docs, uh, last week in a blog post demonstrated an interesting uh, technique uh, and uh, it's around WebView 2. Now, WebView 2 is a technology that allows native Windows software to interact with web applications. You may have seen it without really noticing it. For example, in Microsoft Office, if you're signing in to your Office 365 account, what actually happens is instead of implementing the entire login dialog in like your Office applications, they're just using the web-based login dialog and all order uh, to basically let you enter your credentials and then authenticate you. But this is a little bit different than what happens if you would just open the URL in a browser. WebView 2 allows you to display the HTML from the login page as part of your application, but it also allows you to modify it. So a malicious application uh, could essentially load this in exactly the same Office 365 a login dialog modified at some a keystroke login script, for example, in order uh, to capture your credentials. Could also then, for example, redirect you to some proxy uh, that uh, will capture uh, two-factor authentication tokens that you enter, or maybe you know, not even worry about um, your credentials and just grab whatever session ID or token is being returned after uh, the login procedure completes. So the big difference here versus loading that same login page in a browser is that uh, you're loading it inside that third party application that has then full control over the HTML over the JavaScript of the page. In a browser, you're sort of a little bit more restricted um, as far as the same origin policies and so go where an attacker may not as easily being able to uh, modify the content other than of course, a compromised browser which is exactly sort of uh, what you have happening here with this WebView 2. 
From a defensive point of view, well, uh, if you are asked to enter your credentials, make sure where you're entering them, uh, whether it's inside that application or whether it's on the actual trusted and properly authenticated with TLS and such a uh, web page in a browser. Uh, probably a difference that's really difficult to sort of convey to your average user. And then SecureWorks uh, has an interesting blog about some ransomware, which they actually say is not necessarily ransomware. It looks, smells, behaves like ransomware. It encrypts your files. It exfiltrates data. But according to SecureWorks, likely the primary objective here is to exfiltrate your data, meaning to steal your data and essentially industrial espionage, where the encryption part and the ransomware aspect of it is more or less a distraction. And that's, of course, where we're sort of getting at the heart of some of the attribution issues. If you're looking at an incident, who did it in the end? You often look for circumstances like uh, what did the attacker do with the data? Well, they encrypted it. So you figure, hey, just some other ransomware. Most ransomware now has a sort of an extortion component uh, where they do exfiltrate at least some of the data to then uh, extort you for additional money. But in this case, this appears to be more sort of a nation state kind of uh, espionage campaign uh, where they sort of try to blend in with all the other ransomware, of course, trying to not attract too much attention and too much analysis. CrowdStrike has an interesting write-up uh, that uh, discusses details of a uh, Mitel vulnerability that CrowdStrike has seen being exploited before it was actually known to Mitel and uh, patched. This particular vulnerability is actually not that terribly difficult to exploit. It does require uh, two requests, but in the end sort of comes down to one of those classic uh, PHP remote uh, file inclusion style vulnerabilities. It was used to implant a web shell on affected devices. Mitel, uh, these are essentially sort of voice over IP uh, controller uh, devices, not necessarily known for being terribly super secure. There have been in the past lots of vulnerabilities in these devices and similar uh, devices, but uh, this one, like I said, was exploited before it became known. Mitel released a patch back in April. Now CrowdStrike came forward with the details regarding the vulnerability. So definitely make sure that you keep these systems patched. The exploit that was uh, used here was, like I said, a little bit more sophisticated. It also applied some anti-forensics here by, for example, overriding Slack space and such, which I usually don't see used much in these sort of fairly straightforward uh, IoT style uh, exploits. Well, that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.